prayer, please. Gracious Father, we thank you for this beautiful, beautiful day in Colorado. Mm. And we thank you for all of our members and those who are listening in on our Bible study on this beautiful day in Colorado. We thank you for the opportunity. You brought us through a wonderful uh, celebration of Thanksgiving as we enter into our season of the birth of your son. Mm. This is a wonderful time for us. We love this study. We ask a special blessing about every member on the line. And of course, we ask a special blessing for our pastor who will bring the lesson today. Thank you, Father, for being the gracious Father that you are. It is in your precious name that we pray. Amen. Amen. Thank you so much, Deacon Sandy. Thank you. Thank you. Well, good afternoon. Good to hear everyone's voices. Grateful for those who have signed on. Uh, we pray the Lord is with you. Uh, you felt the Lord with you. Rather, We know the Lord is with us. We pray you felt that presence throughout these days gone by. Uh, we are grateful and excited to be uh, once again in the Advent season. Uh, uh, and here in Denver, we, we know it because we got some snow today. Amen. And so uh, I hope you are warm where you are, even as we pray for those who are with outdoors today and roofs over their heads. Um, but by God's grace, we are here and able to not only pray for others, but encourage and support them as well. So I want to invite you to turn with me to the gospel according to Matthew uh, in the first chapter as we uh, take up together this conversation about the coming of Christ into the world. If you'll turn with me to Matthew chapter 1. Okay. And so as we turned into uh, Matthew's gospel, this first chapter, uh, we're going to, I'm, I'm going to go ahead and just read uh, these first uh, 16 verses filled with these lovely Old Testament names uh, to uh, kick us off, if you will. And then I'd love to share some conversation together about the, the characters in this first chapter and who they are, what they represent, and, uh, and how, in fact, uh, they contribute to what we know about Christ our Savior. Amen? Amen. All right. Matthew chapter one. Here's what it says. An account of the genealogy of Jesus, the Messiah, the son of David, the son of Abraham. Abraham was the father of Isaac and Isaac, the father of Jacob, Jacob, the father of Judah and his brothers and Judah, the father of Perez and Zerah by Tamar and Perez, the father of Hezron, Hezron, the father of Aram and Aram, the father of Amminadab, Amminadab, the father of Nashon. Nashon, the father of Salmon, Salmon, the father of Boaz, and Rahab, by Rahab, and Boaz, by the father of Obed, by Ruth, and Obed, the father of Jesse, and Jesse, the father of King David. David was the father of Solomon, by the wife of Uriah, and Solomon, the father of Rehoboam, and Rehoboam, the father of Abijah, and Abijah, the father of Asaph, and Asaph, the father of Jehoshaphat. Jehoshaphat, the father of Joram, and Joram, the father of Uzziah, Uzziah, the father of Jotham, and Jotham, the father of Ahaz, Ahaz, the father of Hezekiah, and Hezekiah, the father of Manasseh, Manasseh was the father of Amos, and Amos, the father of Josiah, and Josiah, the father of Jeconiah and his brothers at the time of the deportation to Babylon, and after the deportation to Babylon, Jeconiah was the father of uh, Salathiel, and Salathiel the father of Zerubbabel, Zerubbabel the father of Abiud, and Abiud the father of Eli Eliakim, and Eliakim the father of Azor, Azor the father of Zadok, Zadok the father of Akim, and Akim the father of Eliud, and Eliud the father of Eleazar, and Eleazar the father of Mathan. And Mathan, the father of Jacob. And that might be Mathan, not Mathan. And Jacob, the father of Joseph, the husband of Mary, 
of whom Jesus was born, who is called the Messiah. Amen. 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 So let's uh, let's look at this genealogy together, which is what we find, and talk about what this means to to our faith and what these individuals mean to the birth of Christ into the world, what meaning they have and uh, what they represent in the Christ story, and just maybe how they can help us understand more about who Christ is. All right. Any thoughts before we move into that, though? Any thoughts of those 16 verses uh, that I've just shared? Uh, any feedback or expressions or ideas that come to mind? Just the thought of gratitude that you read that for us. Oh, <laughs> amen. Surely, surely. <laughs> All right. And I was going to say, um, it's amazing how everything was planned. Every little detail was planned. We don't necessarily understand it when it's happening, and eventually one day we will. But, you know, all the way, way back, all those names you named, now I can't go back that far, but all mm. those names you named, it was a reason for each one of them being born. I was just reading about um, Elizabeth and uh, Zachariah mm -hmm. and how it was planned for him to, to be involved in this, having this baby that was going to be so special to Jesus. Yes. But he didn't understand it at the time, and he was a priest. So we got to remember, too, sometimes we don't understand everything and don't get upset. Just keep sticking with the Lord as much as you can, and he'll, he'll straighten it out for you. Eventually. All right. That's all. Thank you. Thank you for sharing that. All Amen. Right. I'd like to say this is 42 generations. I can't even think about memorizing, just thinking about it in my head. That's a lot. Yeah. Uh, Pastor, that's a lot of generations. Um, and then to bring forth uh, by Christ, mm -hmm. it's just really amazing how the writers of the Holy Word were able to give us this history of so many generations that we will take a lifetime to understand and maybe not even understand it. But we know from this. Our Savior came. If nothing else, if we if we may not be able to pronounce the names, we may not remember the generation, but we know from whence Jesus came. Amen. Amen. And that's a uh, uh, that's a revelation for us as Christians. Amen. Amen. Thank you so much. Other thoughts, anyone? Thoughts, anyone? Uh, no, but this is Sister Anthony. What book are we in? I just joined. I, I was on another uh, business call. I'm sorry for being late. Hello to everybody. Hi, we're in Matthew chapter 1. Other thoughts, anyone? All right. Well, we'll move ahead. Thank you all so much for your feedback and comments and reflections. And as Jennifer pointed out, uh, Deacon Seal pointed out, this is what we've read are the uh, the first 16 verses of Matthew chapter 1 express the 42 generations leading to the birth of the Messiah, Jesus Christ, our Savior. 
And what we're going to spend some time with today are moving through those generations and talking about those personalities and individuals and their stories and how they all contribute uh, to the lifeline of Jesus. And in fact, in some ways, uh, teach us uh, who he is and who's coming forth to the point that Jennifer made about the fact that our our stories, our family trees, our generations, they do contribute to who we are. So uh, let's begin here with Matthew chapter 1. And uh, uh, these these uh, names here in these first uh, two verses, I think, are a plenty for us. Jesus, the Messiah, son of David, the son of Abraham, who was the father of Isaac, Isaac, the father of Jacob, Jacob, the father of Judah and his brothers. Anyone remember who Abraham was and what he did and what why his name rings such a bell? Anyone remember? Please go right ahead. Well, we felt him as the father of faith. Okay. Yes. He, he was, was a... one who received the the promise that his and his descendants would number like the stars in the sky. That's right. <laughs> That's right. That's right. Thank you. Thank you. Anyone else on Abraham? Okay. So Abraham, that's right, was they called him Father Abraham. He was uh, the, the father of the Hebrew faith. And that's right, he received the promise from God that I will make your descendants like sand on the seashore, stars in the sky, etc. And so it's a, a powerful expression to know that Abraham is in the line of Jesus, that, his, that this, uh, this uh, forefather of the faith uh, is in the line of the Messiah. And that the Messiah, Jesus, has this in his DNA, if you will, this person who heard from God very early on in the history of the world and was a leader. Right. Let's let's talk about. So what, what were some of the things that Abraham did? Uh, some of the things that we know about who Abraham was. Anybody? All right, they birthed Isaac. That's absolutely right. Thank you for sharing that. Yep, so they, they had been praying for a child, unable to conceive, and God made them parents at a very uh, uh, late age in life. That's right. Anyone else on Abraham? Well, we also know that Abraham's faith was demonstrated in his journey, right? So Abraham was was raised in an area called Ur of the Chaldeans, right? And if you remember, uh, Abraham left Ur of the Chaldeans, and his responsibility was to journey to the promised land, right? So over 900 miles, Abraham journeyed, stopping at many places along the way to further his family, to um, prepare himself. He brought along with him his his whole family, his a nephew, Lot, if you remember. Uh, and as well, uh, Abraham brought along the uh, keepers of his home. And essentially, sort of the, the people of Israel began evolving from Abraham's immediate family. And so Abraham was one, the, the father of the faith that shared. But also, the promise God gave Abraham required him to leave his homeland to journey to the promised land and to be the person to lead Israel in that direction. So Abraham was the first to make his way toward Canaan, uh, cross through Egypt, um, through so many different uh, unknown territories to fulfill uh, God's will in his life. And so Abraham sort of sets the stage for what it will mean to be faithful to God by his journeying out and following God's call. All right, and then it talks about Isaac. Anyone remember who Isaac was? Isaac was the son given to Yes, ma'am, that's right. He was the son given to Abraham, the son that Abraham was going to sacrifice, remember? And God said, no, that's right, don't do that. I've got a ram, an actual ram, over in the bush for you. That ram will be a substitute for your son, so that you do not have to sacrifice your own child. 
And so very powerful and important uh, uh, role that Isaac plays because he is part of this early demonstration of what it means to genuinely have deep faith in, in God. All right. That's Isaac. And then Jacob. We remember Jacob and Jacob had a brother. Anyone remember Jacob's brother's name? Esau. That's right. Jacob and Esau. And so these two brothers, a tandem, uh, were, were a treacherous pair, if you will. Uh, but Jacob stands out there and he is um, uh, the son of Isaac alongside his brothers. And then Judah, the father of Perez and Zerah, uh, by Tamar. Anybody remember who Tamar was? Okay. Tamar came from this line of, uh, as it says right there, uh, Judah. And uh, Tamar uh, experienced some um, gender trauma early on in the history of the Bible. Uh, was uh, a, a, a victim of sexual violence, if you will. And her story is often told as it relates to gender violence in the faith. Um, and dealing with gender violence from a biblical perspective. Uh, Tamar is a powerful story. If you get the opportunity to read, it will bless, bless your, your life but, and help us understand uh, how God would have us to uh, live uh, as, as men and women in this world and understand the deep trauma and challenge we experience as it relates to gender in our world. That's Tamar's story. And so, 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 right, so as we read through these generations, we learn that Jesus, uh, the son of Mary and Joseph, has in his family tree these really powerful women who both endured challenging things and who have accomplished amazing things. And so this is what we learn from, uh, from this lineage. We see now not just Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob, but now Tamar enters the picture, all right? And then let's move on down to verse uh, 4. Aram, the father of Aminadab. Aminadab, the father of Nashon. So these Old Testament uh, personalities are coming forth as we learn the stories. And with them, we're again learning, right, that Jesus' line is made up of powerful men and extraordinary women. So we've got Tamar, then we've got Salmon, then we've got Boaz, we've got Rahab, we've got Ruth. So let's let's pause there and talk about these tremendous, tremendous women here. Uh, let's talk about these women. What do we know about Rahab and uh, Ruth and... Uh, this other sister here. Any anyone any thoughts there? Anybody? Well, Rahab helped the spies, mm -hmm. so she was pretty courageous. And Ruth was the sis was the daughter-in-law of Naomi, who decided to go along with Naomi as they had to move. Mm -hmm. But she stuck with her, yeah. and there she met Boaz, yeah. and they, they came together. Okay, all right, thank you. Uh, uh, you know, it's coming back. <laughs> <laughs> all right, other thoughts anybody about, about Ruth and um, uh, Rahab or Tamar? Okay, so well, go well, ahead. Rahab, she was considered, and I have my quote fingers up as uh, a prostitute, but the men of that time would go to her, her place, and a lot of times it was because she was uh, a business minded, established woman, and so.
All right. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Absolutely. Absolutely. I agree 110%. Yep. She was a, a woman of the night, if you were a prostitute, but also had a business mind and was an entrepreneur of sorts. And so as a result, had respect in her community as well, knew the um, stakeholders and leaders in her community. Um, and so uh, while we sort of see one side of her personality, what Jennifer has just shared helps us to grasp the, the other side of that, that, that Rahab was a leader in her community, hence the appearance of these spies at her home that they didn't show up to just anyone's home. They showed up to the home of one who they knew could one, protect them, and two, who was knowledgeable about the community. Very helpful observation, thank you. Other thoughts, anyone, about these powerful women in the lineage of Jesus in verses uh, one through five, no, six, one through six. Okay, all right, let's press on. And so, as we hear about Rahab, we hear about Ruth. What about Ruth? Anyone, any thoughts on Ruth? Anyone? Well, I hate to keep, you know, that's all right. Go right ahead. Ruth, Ruth was um, a, a woman who lived in a very difficult time because she lost her husband. And then when she lost her husband, she had to rely on her sons to take care of her. And so then she lost her sons. And, and so how she was able to survive was, uh, was just uh, mind boggling because women weren't allowed to own property or, you know, or even open their mouths in the synagogue. Mm -hmm. um, but so Ruth was a, a, a powerful uh, person in, in her own right. And and Naomi, is, do I have it the other way around? I think you got it right. I think you got it right. Oh, okay. That Naomi gravitated to her because of her her brilliance and her 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 uh, class and 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 her ability to just go with the flow and not get depressed and and give up. She just kept putting one step in front of the other. She was a, a person who just persevered through all of that. Amen. And she tried to push her away so that she could be successful. Um, but, you know, God had another plan for her. Amen. Yeah. Amen. Uh, the, 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 the one thing that I just remember from days of old is that she was a very loving woman um, and, and really supported, I mean, she was well known for supporting other people as opposed to she sort of put herself in in the second chair, if you will, and and supported others. So Amen. Very, very, very much a loving woman. Amen. Amen. Thank you. Thank you. Mm -hmm. Other thoughts, right. anyone? It was so. It was interesting how she and Naomi had such a great relationship. Being daughter-in-law instead of the daughter, she did kind of place herself in second position under Naomi and followed and did what Naomi told her to do. She was strong. Remember, she would go out to the fields and pick up the leftover, uh, I would say wheat, but they had another name for it. And Boaz would leave it out there for her because he'd seen her. And she gathered that so that they'd have something. But she was always um, trying to help out, I'll put it that way, help out and make the situation a little bit better. Yeah, yeah. amen. All right. Yeah, and, and I would say it was very disciplined because in order to do that, to always be putting others first, you had to be, have, you had to possess a certain amount of discipline and obedience. Right. Amen. And so just imagine all of these characteristics, right, flowing into the lifeline of Jesus and, in fact, being a part of who he is, right? These powerful women, these uh, men who are leaders in their own right, and how all of this makes up the character of Jesus 
in his humanness, that is. Of course, God created him, but certainly his DNA, his characteristics, his personality, he has within him these tremendous, powerful uh, life stories and personalities that contribute to who he is um, as, as, a, as, a, as the Messiah and as uh, one who walks the earth with uh, men, women, and children. Thank you all so much. Other thoughts, anyone, about Ruth? Okay. And then you've also got alongside Ruth, you got Boaz, right? So Naomi, as we shared, lost all of her children uh, and her husband. And along came her daughter-in-law, Ruth. And, and Naomi told Ruth, uh, you can find a, a, uh, a kinsman redeemer, meaning you can find a distant relative who will take you in and who will become your husband and help you to continue your family line. And that man was Boaz. Boaz came along and much like Ruth, uh, stepped into a situation that was uh, not necessarily his plan in life, but a plan God gave to him. And Boaz took uh, Naomi in and in so doing was blessed by this strong, and as you all said, very thoughtful, considerate woman who became his uh, uh, partner in life, his wife, and together uh, they be, they be, they were they begat Jesse, and uh, forgive me, Obed uh, came from the uh, coming together of Boaz and Ruth, and they together bore Obed, and Obed became the father of Jesse. And so this is really powerful in the sense that. You have this extraordinary woman in Ruth, this very strong and powerful gentleman in uh, Boaz, and they bear a child, and Obed, their child, um, bears Jesse. And so Jesse, as we know, is the father of King David. And so isn't it interesting how these two really faithful individuals, prayerful, faithful persons, come together, and they in turn uh, bring forth uh, this line uh, that will do so much uh, uh, toward the kingdom of Israel and then a part of the story of Christ the Messiah. Isn't that powerful? Amen. Mm -hmm. Yeah, powerful, powerful story. Uh, other, other thoughts on that, anyone, on that uh, sixth verse of Matthew 1? Okay, let's go to verse 7. Uh, verse 6 and 7. David was the father of Solomon by the wife of Uriah. And Solomon, the father of Rehoboam. And Rehoboam, the father of Abijah. Abijah, the father of Asaph. Let's talk about that. So what do we know about David, Solomon, and Uriah? Anyone? Okay, that's right. David was a warrior, right? He was the king of Israel, and he was known for being a warrior king, uh, uh, overcame all uh, Israel's enemies across his reign as king, uh, was a military general, uh, was strong and mighty, a tactician, a strategist, etc. And uh, so much so that God said, David, essentially, you know, you're too warring of a king to build a sanctuary, a temple. So we're going to leave that to your son Solomon, right? That what happened? Right. Yeah. And so so and David... Solomon, go ahead. I was just going to say, uh, Solomon did build it, but he was also considered, especially for that part of the world, as one of the, the wisest people around. Um, he just had a lot of wisdom and knew how to, to uh, use it. Absolutely. Yep. So David uh, begat Solomon, and Solomon became known as the wisest man in Israel. He prayed and asked God for wisdom, right? And so you've got David and Solomon. So you got David, this mighty king, Solomon, this deeply wise king. And in between the two of them, you've got Uriah. Let's talk about this. 
So as we're, we're tracing now the, the, the genealogy of Jesus, we see David, we see, uh, as we talked about, uh, Boaz and Ruth, who bore Obed. Obed begat Jesse. Jesse became the father of David. And so all these really powerful people in Jesus' family line. And then you find David, and uh, along comes Solomon by the wife of Uriah. Let's talk about that. How does that happen? That Solomon was born to David by the wife of Uriah. Let's unpack that together. What does that mean exactly? Well, they had a lot of wives. Yeah. And some of them were um, some of them were the the slaves of of servants or servants servants of the household. Okay. Yes. And David saw her taking a bath, and they uh, connected. Okay. And so he he knew better because yes. she was actually Uriah was um, uh, um, she was someone else. She was Uriah's wife. She was Uriah's he, wife. Mm -hmm. Yeah. And so I think it's important to name that. Uh, because, again, right, it gives us the fullness of gene Jesus' genealogy and helps us to understand, in some ways, how he, the Savior of the world, the Messiah, the Christ child, is able to identify with humankind, right? Because in his family line, there are personalities of every sort. Amen? And so we see here... Amen. Right. We see here that Jesus comes through a lineage that has in it King David, who has had a child, Solomon, through a woman who was not his wife, with whom he really had, if you stop and think about it, non-consensual relationships. So in the sense of, so think about it, Bathsheba is out, as you share, bathing uh, in the place where she's supposed to be. King David shows up. And he is essentially, if you stop and think about it, right, he is watching a woman bathe. So really, right, what he is doing is out of line in a whole lot of ways. So mm -hmm. you just go a step forward. You, know, you may as well say that. And, but not just that. David's uh, lust gets the best of him. But, but more than that, his mindset about life and the world around him David's a warrior king, and he goes as far as to put Uriah, who's this woman's husband, in harm's way. He sends Uriah, as you remember, out to war, put him on the front line, and almost assured that he won't make it back alive. And he does not, right? So David goes beyond just, hey, he's a peeping Tom. Okay, hey, his, his uh, bodily wants get the best of him. But he goes as far as to take another woman's husband and put him in a position where he'll lose his life because he wants this woman for his wife. So, so again, it teaches us that Jesus's life, his, his uh, family line, his genealogy is made up of a really diverse mix of people who bring uh, a number of different experiences in their backgrounds, some good and some not so good. But these things together make Jesus who he is. Amen? Amen. Uh, they equip Jesus with the ability to understand humankind. They equip him with the ability to be able to identify with people who are hurting. Tamar, who was traumatized, right? Solomon, who came from uh, parents who came out of a traumatic experience together. Uh, Boaz and Ruth who were essentially a blended family, right? So he, so he, Jesus is able to identify because this is what makes up his family tree. And I think it's so important and critical for us to understand that as believers, not so that we glorify trauma or that we overlook um, a lustful misstep because all these things need uh, reconciliation and, and redemption and forgiveness, but more so because it helps us to see who Jesus really is. 
and why he can relate so well to humankind and why you and I are called to do the same. That it does us no good to spend our days. I was listening this morning, in fact, to a podcast of uh, former First Lady Michelle Obama. And she was talking about how uh, she presents her, she does her best to present her authentic self. And she spoke about the fact that as a black woman, that sometimes that's difficult because we're often tempted to present to the public around us a face, a mask that is a bit more perfect and pleasing to society in order to gain acceptance. And that reminds me of this in the sense that as we look at Jesus's lineage, we see some miracle and some mess. Amen. Amen. And what we learn is that Jesus, Amen. yeah, that Jesus uses this for God's good. And so I think likewise, it's important for us to see our lives, our genealogies, people in our family tree the same way and that of others. Right. So rather than looking down our nose at people who have a checkered past or people in their family line who they may not be proud of in terms of their behaviors or their incidents in life. People in our own families who, you know, we had Thanksgiving. We know there are people who at Thanksgiving and Christmas and not everyone who shows up are our favorite people. Amen. And sometimes some of the folks who show up don't always get along. Amen again. But the fact is, amen, amen but we're still family. And that's what Jesus' genealogy teaches us. And no matter what the family's been through, we're still family. And these experiences in the genealogy help us to understand how God can work all things for our good. So God, the creator, takes this real life blended family tree, this family tree of all kinds of backgrounds and all kinds of mix-ups and mess-ups and mistakes, as well as blessing and glory and goodness and grace. God melds it together and brings forth his only begotten son. Amen? Amen. That's, amen. that's what God amen. does. Amen. That is what God does there. And so it's important for us to grasp, because again, right, this idea, if we are not careful, we take on this misnomer that in order to be God's child, I have to present this perfect person. Well, that's just not true. Second of all, none of us are perfect. Again, we don't, we're not here to boast about our missteps or mistakes as human beings or to say that as the human race goes left, that, oh, everything's going to be all right. No, no, that's not what, that ain't right. We, we, we got to try to do right and be right. Nevertheless, what Jesus' genealogy teaches us is we are God's children nevertheless. That God has made us God's own and God wants us to learn how to be, as Michelle Obama said, our authentic selves the best way we can. So rather than denying our backgrounds, where we've come from, traumas we've been through, troubles we face. Uh, issues we've overcome and become better, what, what God is saying here as we look at this genealogy is, I can bring goodness and glory out of anything. So you and I have got to learn that our challenges do not absent us from God's hand on our, hand on our lives. That our challenges are just that, and our job is to overcome the challenge, not to pretend it doesn't exist or to try to tell our family story and leave some folks out. You know, we, we, we tell the family story. We got some people's names we don't want to bring up. Or we tell the family line and we give all the examples of all the folks who accomplished great things and leave out those whose stories are less pleasing to the ear. What God is saying is, no, no, we are made up of all of those stories. And the best thing we can do in being authentic is to celebrate God in the midst of all of them. Amen? Amen. 
Any thoughts Amen. about that, anyone? Amen. Any thoughts about that, anybody? You know, um, Pastor, I was just thinking about how we started this off and how, you know, all of these things were set into motion because if we remember, Paul tells us that we are going to go through trials and, you know, these were trials of these people, all of them, and they went through them and they kept the faith and that's what is supposed to be being taught to us mm. to keep the faith yes. in God so that we can continually move forward because he does love us as his children yeah. and as long as we love him and obey him he will provide and protect us amen 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 thank you other thoughts anyone Yes, I have some this. I had, um, this is a wonderful lesson because uh, families have, uh, as we come up on the holidays, you know, we we had uh, difficulties with our families. My brother who was alcoholic and came and disturbed the dinner all the time and nobody wanted him to come to the dinner. <laughs> but my mother always said, he's my son. That's right. And he's coming. That's right. You know, and we were just sitting there going, oh, he's coming. <laughs> and she said, you don't react to him that way. Yeah. Try a little love and a little tenderness. That's right. And see, doesn't that change the atmosphere? And all right, did. Deacon, all right. And it does. Yeah. And as, I, as, you, as we reviewed this and I listened to all of the people who contributed, it, it just brought to my, my family at the kinds of things that we've had to happen. Yeah. You know, we've had some of these same incidents in our family. Mm. This is why we have, it's just so wonderful that we have Jesus who, that's why he understands all of our problems. Amen. Because Amen. he came from the same, he came from the same line that we are coming through. Amen. And it just really, just really has really if I listen to all of the, the members on the line, Jennifer, and all of them speak, it just brought back these kinds of memories for me. Thank mm. you. Amen. Thank you. Thank you. Powerful sharing there. That you're right. That that that's our calling, right? That we are we are all family, and and you're right. Every family has its challenges to overcome. It's and, and it's grace to learn how to share. Every family. And, and sometimes those of us who have to who have to share the grace are some of the same who need it at other times, right? And so to the point you made, Deacon Sandy, about what your mother shared, that that's our calling. And it's all through the Bible, right? Whether we talk about the prodigal son, whether we talk about Esther stepping up to her duty and responsibility, or here in the genealogy of Jesus, that every family family line uh, has can 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 identify with this one of Jesus. So thank you so much for sharing that. Thank you so much. Other thoughts, anyone? Oh uh, yeah, this is Rose Rita. Yes, ma'am. And uh, yeah, um, again with family, you know, no one's perfect. So all of us can sit down and talk negatively forever about the next person. So I think it's important to let bygones be bygones. Um, this Thanksgiving for our family here was the best Thanksgiving they have said we've ever had. Mm. We got, I think timing has played a big part as we mature and we know how to let things go. Mm. Uh, we ended up with 24 family members together in this house. Wow. John and I. That's wonderful. And mother, it will be 95 on the 9th of December. Wow. And this, he keeps talking about it. Yes, there are situations between certain ones. They hadn't seen each other for quite a while. Right. Some four years. But it just happened. It just, God just let it happen. And every single child and adult from four years old to 95 almost years old had a hallelujah joyful time together in this house. 
Amen. And I will never, never forget it. So to be that bygone, be bygone. Mm. And it just happens on its own. They keep saying, and I, they say, we don't know how you got. Every single person came. Mm. Every single member of this family came. Mm. And I don't think we'll ever have it so wonderful. And I'm so thankful to God because Mother, I don't think we'll stop talking about how happy every single one of us here in this house. Amen. So, yeah, we can sit down and we can talk negatively about each other because no one's perfect. But we need to let it go. Mm. Amen. Mm. Thank yeah. you. Thank yeah. you so much for sharing. Yeah. Thank you so much. Powerful. Amen. Powerful. Other thoughts, anyone? I, you know, as many times as I am, you know, seeing or heard this um, chapter one of, of Matthew preached or discussed, I never paid attention to that one line that David was the father of Solomon, whose mother <laughs> was not, was so much. Powerful sharing. Other thoughts, anyone? All right. Powerful sharing. Yeah, so so the, the points made here today, yeah, our, our, our families are living beings, that we are human beings, and we are called into relationship with each other. You don't, you don't get to choose your family, amen? You don't get to choose your family. Well, yet, God calls us to to be caregivers and supporters of and with our families, that we're to take care of each other, love each other, as we shared today, and to learn how to forgive each other and to receive forgiveness from each other. Amen. And 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 as Jennifer shares, to not you know to to work to not deny our family histories, even in the most uncomfortable uh, pages of those histories. Because those family histories, they, they are a part of who we are. You see, we can deny those things, but they have a way of, of surfacing in our lives, of, of, uh, of appearing, emerging in our journey. And I think it's important to the points you all made today that we better reconcile those places in the family history that are not as easy to understand and so that we can learn from them and that we can give grace to them and receive the same. You'd be surprised at how many people carry around struggles from their family's history uh, who come to feel inadequate or, or uh, lessened self-esteem or sense of self because of something in their family history that's unreconciled. And so I think it's so important what you all shared today because you never know how, how you're helping to set someone free from bonds of shame or hurt or trauma by hope, by not holding on to stuff and, and by forgiving folks and receiving forgiveness and, and uh, affirming people as God's children because they walk away from those family gatherings or those conversations or those phone calls or whichever the case it is, being living, uh, feeling one way or another based on how we treated each other. And so it's so powerful to be able to come together and to 
to, to offer forgiveness and receive it and to see each other as family, no matter what we have been, been through and how to reconcile that some stuff that we've been through needs to be addressed and reconciled, uh, uh and, um, and, 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 uh, receive forgiveness and given forgiveness from so we can move forward. But at the end of the day, the point is that we're family and that God has taken this family line of Jesus and brought him into the world. And so Jesus came through a line of the father of the faith, Abraham, through a, 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 a brother, a sibling who had a rivalry, Jacob and Esau, through a woman who was a prostitute, yet a business owner, uh, an entrepreneur and a community leader through Boaz who came together with Ruth, who had uh, lost her husband and was now a widow. Uh, so, and through Solomon, who was born through, as we just shared, uh, two who were not initially married. And so it shows us that God is able to, to take this powerful background. You also have King Hezekiah. You have uh, King Uzziah, right? These powerful, faithful kings. King Josiah. Josiah was one of the most faithful kings in Israel. He was a, a, a reformer king who reformed worship and the temple. So these powerful backgrounds through which God brings Jesus. So I'd love to continue this conversation next week. We're going to pause here for today as our time draws to a close. But I want to thank all of you for sharing uh, as we delve in together to the Matthew chapter 1, 1 through 6 and 7. And we'll pick up there next week. And Matthew 1, as we continue this celebration of the birth of Christ into the world. Thank you so much for joining us on our Facebook stream. Hope you'll see us again next week. We'll see you again next week. God bless you.